August 480 BC, the Greek army led by King Leonidas and 300 Spartans is facing a Persian army of a quarter of a million men. The Persian king Xerxes watched in disbelief as 700 Greek troops formed up at the valley entrance. They lined up in a phalanx formation. The phalanx was a forest of spears. The commander would signal for the push, the rear ranks pushing forward and pressing their shields against the backs of the men in front, and you pushed against the forces opposing you and literally tried to shove them backwards and drive them off the field. They trained their whole lives for this moment. This phalanx was 18 men deep and 64 across. Their shields overlapped like the scales of a serpent's back, virtually impenetrable. The first three ranks lowered their spears and rolled forward towards the Medes. In contrast to the Greeks, the Medes were lightly armed. They carried light wickerwork shields and spears. Before they advanced, the meat archers fired a volley into the phalanx. Leonidas sent in more Greeks to reinforce the phalanx, pressing their weight into the backs of their fellow troops. Volley after volley of arrows filled the sky. The Greek infantry had a three-foot shield. The shields were bronze-faced with maybe two inches of oak underneath that. So if you want to think of that, think of that as a kitchen cutting board and how hard you can whack a cutting board with a battle if you can't break it. As the Greeks began to tire, Leonidas sent in his Spartan warriors. They advanced in a phalanx formation as the exhausted Greeks ran back. As they would advance, they would be talking to each other and inspiring each other, encouraging each other to advance while these other people are coming, advancing towards you. I mean, as each step got closer and closer, the terror must have been unbelievable. The highly trained Spartans slaughtered all in front of them. The Medes saw that their own weapons were useless and in desperation began grabbing at the Spartan spears. And now the Spartans drew the Xiphos, and the real butchery began. Are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you thirsty? Are you wounded? It doesn't matter. You're a warrior and you fight. The confined space made it impossible for the Persians to take advantage of their superior numbers. They could not pack enough men into battle against this unrelenting killing machine. Combat in those days was, was all hand-to-hand. -hand. Nobody shot anybody, no smart bombs came in. If you were gonna kill the enemy, he was gonna be right in your face and trying to kill you. Wave after wave, Xerxes' warriors perished as they tried to penetrate the Spartan shield wall. Leonidas joked, Xerxes has plenty of men but no soldiers. But the Spartans took casualties as well. Spartans had a method for identifying their dead, many of whom were battered beyond recognition. They would take a twig and put their mark at either end. And they'd break it in half. Half was kept in a bowl behind the lines, and the other was worn around the wrist. So there you have the ancient equivalent of a dog tag. If the soldier survived, he could reclaim his twig after the battle. If not, the dead and lost could be easily counted. As the battle moved into the second day, the Persians could make no headway. They were simply not prepared for this kind of fighting. Far removed from the wide open plains of the east where cavalry, chariots, and light infantry could decide the outcome. Sitting on his hillside throne, Xerxes became more and more agitated, jumping to his feet every so often like a spectator at a football game. Xerxes just said, hey, you guys go out there and take that pass, kick these guys out of the way. And these lightly armed Medes went up against the heavily armed Greeks, and the heavily armed Greeks kicked their butt. Xerxes decided to play his trump card and send in the immortals. Their 
might have been hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the battlefield, but now the combat was between two fighting elites. 10,000 Persian immortals against what remained of 300 Spartans. August 480 BC. The Spartans had held the pass at Thermopylae for nearly a day and a half. Xerxes had failed to crack their defense. Now he gambled everything by sending in his own personal guard, the Immortals. They were a magnificent sight. They carried bows, spears, and short daggers. But rank after rank of the elite shock troops fell in the dust. The light-armed Persians couldn't penetrate the Greek armor, but the Greeks could penetrate them at will. And also the Greeks were trained to fight at close quarters and to come to grips at close quarters. Nothing could shake the Spartans. Xerxes needed a miracle and it came from an unexpected source. A Greek trader, Ephialtes, seeing a chance to get rich quick, crossed over to the Persian camp. He told Xerxes about a pathway that wound around the mountainside and came out behind the Spartans. The name Ephialtes has entered the modern Greek language. It means nightmare in modern Greek. Ephialtes is today a nightmare. Under cover of darkness, the Persians filed up the track and on the morning of day three, emerged behind the Spartans. Leonidas had been outflanked. He knew this would be his last battle. To avoid unnecessary casualties, he sent the rest of the Greek army home. The Spartans would stand alone. It must have been an amazingly emotional moment. As men were walking out, brave men, knowing they were going to live, while others were walking up to the front line knowing that they were going to die. One of the Greeks had warned, the Persians have so many archers that their arrows will blot out the sun. Well said the Spartan Dionikis, we will fight in the shade. This was Spartan wit. And when somebody says something like that, you laugh and fear goes away. Leonidas was more somber. He ordered his men to breakfast saying, tonight we shall dine in Hades. As the battle recommenced, the Persians closed in from both sides on the tiny band of Spartan survivors. The Spartans, with nothing to lose, fought like demons. The Persians suffered heavy losses. Then Leonidas fell. His Spartan soldiers rushed forward to save his body from capture and mutilation. The fact that the Greeks fought in the way they did to preserve his body from the Persians at the moment of final defeat, again symbolizes how important the position, the, the status, the role of the king, the leader, actually was. Xerxes now decided to bring this battle to a quick end. He had tried to fight soldier to soldier in the honorable tradition of his Persian ancestors, but he could not break the Spartans. He had lost nearly 10,000 men including two of his own brothers. He decided to withdraw his troops. He would finish the Spartans off at a safe distance with arrows. The Spartans regarded the bow as a weapon for cowards because it killed from a distance. Thousands of arrows rained down on the broken Spartans until not one was left standing. They were finished off by the weapons they despised most. A furious Xerxes ordered his men to find the body of Leonidas, and once they'd found it, to cut off his head and stick it on a pole. The Spartan king had made him pay a terrible price for victory at Thermopylae. 10,000 casualties was a drop in the bucket from such a vast force. 
but it was a blow to Xerxes and the morale of his army. They trained their whole lives for this moment. This phalanx was 18 men deep and 64 across. Their shields overlapped like the scales of a serpent's back. Forward and pressing their shields against the backs of the men in front, and you pushed against the forces opposing you and literally tried to shove them backwards and drive them off the field. Virtually impenetrable. The first three ranks lowered their spears and rolled forward towards the Medes. In contrast to the Greeks, August 480 BC, the Greek army led by King Leonidas and 300 Spartans is facing a Persian army of a quarter of a million men. The Persian king Xerxes watched in disbelief as 700 Greek troops formed up at the valley entrance. They lined up in a phalanx formation. The phalanx was a forest of spears. The commander would signal for the push, the rear ranks pushing forward.